what is the Baha'i faith? This is directly from the Baha'is of the United States website. We are one. And that sums up the Baha'i faith in three words. We are one. Baha'is believe in the unity of mankind and everyone in one diverse but unified body. Now, you may be wondering, why am I speaking to you, a secular group, about the Baha'i faith? Now, I don't know if anyone recognizes this gentleman. Uh, he is Clement Attlee, and he was the Prime Minister of Great Britain just after World War II. And on one occasion when he was being interviewed and asked about religion, what he said was, I believe in, Christian, in the ethics of Christianity, but I can't believe in the mumbo jumbo. So what I would like to say is, I'm going to speak to you about some of the ethics and principles as well as the buildings of the Baha'i faith. And I would hope that some of you may have a Clement Attlee moment. For me, one of the writings which drew me in was this one, all men are created to carry forward a never advancing civilization. This really inspired me. And if you're worried about created, you can translate that into the more secular, everybody is born to carry forward a never advancing civilization. And not just a civilization of technology or religion or morals, but an all-encompassing, ever-advancing civilization. So a little bit about the Baha'i faith in order that you can understand where it's coming from. The Baha'i faith originated in what is presently Iran, or was called Persia at the time, and it was back in the mid-1800s. And a person called the Bob was the first prophet of the faith. And he introduced a faith called the Bobby faith in 1844. And he continued to lead that faith until his martyrdom in 1850. During all that time, the faith was heavily persecuted by the Muslim authorities. And after his uh, martyrdom, there was a number of years went by where the friends simply tried to keep each other together. And then another Baha'u'llah, he came forth and said he was the second prophet and he was uh, predicted by the Bob. And he announced this in 1863 and he continued to lead the faith until his death in 1892. Now, Again, the persecution continued. The believers were moved around from place to place, and they eventually landed in Haifa, Israel, and they were in prison there for many years. Things eased up slightly after a while, close to the end of Ahawa's life. But when he died, he named his son as the leader of the faith, Abdul Baha. And he led the faith until he died in 1921. And there was a little bit of, people were a little unsure what was going to happen. But his will and, state, will and testament clearly stated that his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, should become the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And that he would lead the faith until his death in 1957. This was supposedly a hereditary title, the guardian of the faith, but he died without children, and so there was a slight hiatus, and the members of the faith came together, and by now it had expanded to a global religion, and there was enough people to vote for the Universal House of Justice, and the Universal House of Justice was voted uh, into place, and on the centenary of Baha'u'llah's declaration was the first session of the house and it leads the Baha'i faith to the present day. Now, why is it called the universal house of justice? Baha'is believe that without justice, 
We cannot have that unity of mankind because if people can never be united if there are many people feeling they are unjustly treated. So justice is a key factor in the Baha'i faith. Now, I mentioned Haifa was where they landed up, all the followers of Baha'u'llah landed up in Haifa. And Haifa is where the World, World Baha'i Center is. And I have put the date of 21st of April, uh, 1963, because that was when the Universal House of Justice came into effect. But things were being developed throughout the 20th century. This is a picture of Mount Carmel in Haifa, which is the location of the Baha'i World Center. This was 1910. And as you can see, it's kind of a wilderness. There's no real roads. And you notice some building work going on in the middle of the picture. By 1952, you can see Haifa has started to develop as a city. And you can see the starts of terraces being built and the shrine that is actually the shrine of the bath that's where today the remains of the bath are housed is coming along and by the mid 50s it was completed and you can see now there's a much more developed area in Haifa this is simply looking around the same time but an aerial view and you can see that the shrine and some of the buildings are really still in the middle of scrubland. And again, 1960, this is looking down in the opposite direction now. This is looking down to that road we saw. But it's slightly more developed. It wasn't really till 91, 1991 that work really started. And there was a massive project instigated to build the terraces. We can see all the construction work going on building the Baha'i terraces. And this is what they look like today. And we're looking up the terraces towards the shrine. And if you look down towards these gates, this is what you see. So it's been completely transformed into what it is in the present day. Now, let's look now. At, but while that was going on, around the world, there was other developments going on. Continental houses of justice were being built, and there was one on each continent. There's currently eight are in existence. There have been two local houses of, uh, houses of worship built just recently, but these are the eight, and this shows the locations. And what I want to do is just go through, let you have a look at the Baha'i houses of worship around the world, and also in each of them discuss a key Baha'i principle. Now, you may be wondering why Baha'is how can Baha'is worship if there's only eight houses of worship? Well, there are only, these are the continental ones, but Baha'is meet everywhere, outside, in people's living rooms, in community centers, some cities. Houston has a Baha'i center, which is on Fannin, and a number of cities do have Baha'i centers where meetings are held. But essentially, wherever it is and whatever culture is in effect. Baha'is meet. The only three things that are necessary is that there's a spiritual element to the meeting, a business element where the business of the faith is discussed, and a social portion. And there will be much as you have in your meetings, there'll be music, discussion, etc. Only one of these pictures shows a house of worship. The top left, the right is the Indian house of worship. All the rest are just in the community. Now the first house of worship built was in the United States and it was opened in 
Wilmette in 1953. And this is the picture here. I see you've actually got that on your website, this exact picture, but it's a beautiful thing. It's made in concrete. They just recently had to redo many of these intricate pieces of work because of uh, acid rain and it was upgraded. And the first principle I would like to speak about is unity and diversity. We, we've spoken about unity, but sometimes unity can be imposed and, and this is harsh. But for the highs, we believe unity and diversity. When we look at this flower garden here, we look at that and think, wow, that is beautiful. Look at all the different colors, the different shapes, the different sizes. This is wonderful. We think this is great. But when we move to a group like that with all sorts of different sizes, colors, speeches, religions, etc., we start having problems and we start focusing not on the diversity and the beauty of, it, of the overall, but on individual differences. So I, I won't read the quotes that are in each of these. I'll give you a second to read that. But essentially, Baha'is value unity, but with diversity, unity in diversity. And moving on, the next house of worship was in Uganda, in Kampala. And here you'll see this is quite different. One of the things you'll notice is that as you see them all, everyone has nine entrances and everyone has light windows or some method of getting daylight into the main chamber. Another interesting point is that everything that you've seen up to now and all the houses of worship are paid for only by Baha'is. It is not possible for a non-Baha'i to contribute to Baha'i funds. And in this one, the harmony of science and religion. Baha'is clearly believe that scientific fact is scientific fact, and if there is conflict between scientific fact and religious dogma, scientific fact should reign. And so Baha'is believe that science supports religion or report, supports religious views, and in the event that it does not, then it is ignorant superstition and not faith. Next, we move to Australia, and that was in 1961 that the House of Worship opened in Australia. And this is the only one which is similar to another. This one, as you see, is very similar to the Uganda one before that. It was designed by the same architect. But this is the only one. All the rest you'll notice are unique apart from the key features. And next principle I'd like to look at is the equality of men and women. Baha'is believe that men and women are equal, and until women are accorded the rights and privileges of men, society will not advance as well as it could. So it's very clear. And one of the analogies Baha'is use very often is the two wings of a bird one's male, one's female. And if they are unequal, the bird will be able to, will not be able to fly, or if it can fly, not very well. So it needs to be a balance between genders. Next, we move to Europe and the European Continental House in Germany and it was opened again in 61. This is quite a different looking one again, but you can see again, nine entrances and this huge dome with all the windows to allow light into the main, the main chamber. And the next principle I'd like to look at is truthfulness. Truthfulness. High. A Baha'i writing which says truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. 
essentially, society is based on truthfulness. We cannot function properly if we do not trust each other. We cannot have a united society. So everything is based on truthfulness, justice, unity, and any aspect of society is based on truthfulness and honesty. Baha'i strongly believe that and as far as possible try to practice that. We now jump across the Atlantic to 1972 and the Panama one. We have this beautiful eggshell type dome. And again, you've got light in from the top and nine entrances. And the Baha'i faith is always expanding. And as it expands, it expands the houses of worship. Universal compulsory education. We've spoken about a number of things, but justice and unity are not possible without education. So I believe that we should have compulsory education. Everybody should be educated so that they can understand and participate in society. And Baha'is have an educational system with it for teaching the Baha'i faith but they mean they would they must have an education you must have an education system that teaches people read and write and do all the basics and be able to study science and religion and to understand the ethics and now we move further out into the ocean to samoa we have this it's somewhat similar to the panama one but it's here in this tropical paradise, very beautiful. And the principle I would like to touch on is a universal auxiliary language. One of the problems in the world is people communicating with each other. Now, there is often, if you have empires or all encompassing bodies, they enforce their language on people. Baha'i writings say that a universal language will ultimately be selected. But this will be an auxiliary universal language. People will, with regards to diversity, they will still learn their native language or dialect and the, the universal language. But this helps to aid the concept of unity and Presumably justice too, because if we can speak to each other in the same language, it's easier to ensure justice. We move on to India now, and this probably, maybe one shouldn't really say it, but this is really the most spectacular of all of them. This is the one that is shown in many, many travel brochures and many architectural magazines have featured this. It's often called the Lotus Temple. It's in Delhi in India. But again, it still has the same principle, nine entrances and the light comes in through the Lotus petals. And there's a really interesting story about the whole project management and construction of this which I would love to speak to you about at some other time. But for this, I would like to speak about the independent investigation of truth. Now we've covered auxiliary languages and uh, education, and Baha'is believe that it's incumbent on you to educate yourself. This isn't about draconian imposition of a religion or a faith. It's up to individuals to independently investigate and come to their own decisions. And this is what, again, one of the writings, but it's not about blind imitation. It's about clear thinking and investigation. And finally, we come to San Diego, Chile, which was just opened four years ago. This is the new Baha'i 
center. And again, it's completely different from all the rest, but it still has the entrances and the light in from the top. And the final principle I'd like to look at is the elimination of wealth and poverty. I believe that you cannot have justice, you cannot have unity if you have extremes of wealth and poverty in the law. And this isn't some communistic idea of taking people's wealth. It's creating a fair and just society where people, maybe like Bill Gates, are willing to give away their fortune and do uh, altruistic deeds, but the, I, there'll be a number of ways to redistribute the wealth fairly, but without imposing draconian measures. And we need to create a society. And if you think that's not possible, if you think about certain companies, certainly companies have high ethical values. And even if someone's a sociopath in these companies, they will comply because they want to succeed, but the cost is too great to flaunt the high moral standards. So if you create a society with these high moral standards, people, the cost to people who think they may flaunt them is too high. Now, I'm drawing to the end, and I just have a quick summary here, looking at all the beautiful architecture. The upper one is the dome in the Wilmet, and the lower right is the dome in Chile. There's obviously the Indian temple and the Baha'i, uh, the shrine of the Bob, and this eagle is one of many in the terraces. But why am I trying to convince you that it's something that all people, whether secular or religious, should be thinking about? Well, we had a situation 100 years ago where globalization 1.0 was coming into effect. The world was coming together. People were acting more in unison. But that died in the blood and mud of Flanders. So we went through a horrible period in the 20th century, but now we're moving again into another globalization period where mankind is coming together. But now we're starting to see people, uh, anti-globalists, super nationalists, trying to undermine the idea of a global. And you need to have this moral attitude towards globalization. This isn't just the big boys holding the power over the little. So that is why I consider it very important for people, whether secular or religious, to consider the unity and justice for mankind. So I would like to thank you. And if you go away with one thought, this, we are all flowers of one garden. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Right. Having some technical difficulties on my end, so hopefully we're good to go here. <laughs> Um, but uh, we are going to come back. Uh, I've got a couple questions that I see have already started to pop up. Um, before we do Q&A, we're going to break out into our discussion groups. Um, this gives everyone a bit of a chance uh, to say hi to each other, come up with some questions, refill their coffee, whatever they need to do. Um, so if you'd like to join, Abhishek's going to break us up into our discussion groups here in just a second. Um, you can click join or you can click not now and you can step away and um, take a bit of a break and uh, use this time to say hello to other people. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, it's a great time to post your questions in the comments and we'll be back in about... 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully everyone had a chance to um, say hi, refresh your coffee, uh, come up with some Q&A. Um, we did have a few questions pop up uh, during the main talk, so we'll just kind of go ahead and get started with those. Uh, the first one we have for you, Jim, you use the word worship a lot. 
what is the, the Baha'i understanding of what worship means and what and who is being worshipped? Okay, um, who would be worshipped was Baha'is believe that there is one God and one God, uh, all the various previous prophets had given their word. That, that was the same God. There was no difference. It's one single supreme being, and that is what Baha'is believe. Uh, worship, Baha'is also believe that worship is not just praying and meeting, like you would say in church or something, or at the Baha'i meetings. Work, work and art and, you know, doing your craft can be worship as well. Baha'is encourage people. We, we mentioned uh, the idea of elimination of wealth and poverty. Very much you have to work. The idea, you know, it's understood that people fall in hard times and they have to be helped. But in general, people should do work, meaningful work, perform meaning, and that is worship as well. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. There are several universal auxiliary languages that have been developed over the years. Has the Baha'i religion offered any suggestions as to which of these languages might be favored? No, not at the moment. There hasn't been guidance on that. Apparently, I believe that I can't, I didn't lay my hand on the definition, but I believe Baha'u'llah said he favored it being Arabic. And this was because I think the technical quality of Arabic. And not being an Arabic speaker, I can't speak to that. But apparently he considered Arabic was extremely, you could uh, express yourself very well in Arabic, uh, more so than other languages. But that was just a thought. And the Universal House of Justice has not come out in favor of, somebody mentions Esperanto, they have not come out in favor of one. And often, if things are not clear, they will wait and see how things develop. And it may be that a new language will evolve, or it may be that one particular language simply de facto becomes it. But we don't know. Awesome. Uh, next question, uh, what is the worldwide estimated number of adherents to the Baha'i Faith? Around 6 million and in the U.S. 175. My wife, Terry, stepped in and helped me out there and looked that one up. So yeah, 6 million worldwide, 175,000 here in the U.S. And then uh, next question, are the prophets considered divine? No, they are considered to be divinely inspired, but they're not divine in the sense that Christians tend to believe that Jesus is God, the Trinity, and all that. They're not, and not, and they are still men, special men, but they're not. Uh, they're not divine in in that sense. All right. Uh, assuming that faith is pretending to know things you don't, uh, what do you know that, what do you know through your faith that you don't? Is If you don't accept that definition, what is your definition of faith? Say that again. Uh, the, it, the question is, assuming that faith is, uh, the question is pretending to know things that you don't, what do you know that you don't? If you don't accept that definition of faith, what is your definition? Uh, so, um, are there things that you know through your faith, yeah. um, or do you have a different? Def Does the Baha'i faith have a different definition of faith than, oh, than that? A uh, belief in the, the writings and in the, the key figures in the faith is the main belief. And to be honest, I'm not the best person to best of. Baha'is to say about faith because I probably tend more to the Clement Attlee end of the uh, the spectrum. 
But um, so I, I can't really answer you on faith as such. I am much more of a scientific, practical, and these things make sense. So therefore, I'll go along with the rest of stuff. All right, next question. Uh, do you have any uh, favorite writings um, that you would recommend to someone interested in learning about the faith uh, and possibly writings that are good introductions to kid, for kids? Hey, probably the, there's the one about the world, flowers and one garden. I, I kind of paraphrased that last phrase, but there is one on we are all flowers and one garden and I'd need to look up where it was. And the one that I said at the beginning, which was the, we are, the and that's the one that really grips me is we are all created to carry forward and never advancing civilization. That is, but there are masses of them online and there's many websites that give different, different ones. But uh, I, that one particularly, resonates with me. Um, and I'm going to merge two questions here. What is uh, the Baha'i faith concept of an afterlife? Is there a hell or heaven? Yeah. Now, Baha'is believe that there is an afterlife. And that when you pass, you will go to an afterlife. It's not... Like most religions, it's not specifically, you know, clear. It's not like the Vikings where you will go there and kill people and be raised up every day and eat and drink. And it's not, it's not kind of well defined. Like most of the, most of the monotheistic religions don't have a particularly clear definition of it. But Baha'is belief that we are here to develop. And the analogy that's given is about a child in the womb. When a child is growing in the womb, and that child is being prepared for this world, if something goes wrong with the pregnancy and somehow the child is affected, that in some way affects how they interact and how they live and that they're able to live in this life. And Baha'is believe the same thing with regards to the afterlife, that there isn't a hell and there isn't a heaven. There's, there's an afterlife, but if you haven't developed well, you will not cope with the afterlife. And so it might be like hell because it's difficult. But if you have developed, uh, and that's part of the worship in your faith, uh, if you develop, then when you go to the afterlife, you will be prepared for it. And I guess it will be like heaven. So there isn't, a, you're not condemned to heaven for doing bad things. It's a question of preparing. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, is there anything that you particular criticize about the Baha'i faith? Anything that you think could be done better? What? Uh, something about yeah sorry um is there yeah. anything that you uh well we're not supposed to do that because one of the one of the one of the key tenets which i didn't touch on is no backbiting the highs are not supposed to backbite and that goes right down to speaking about the neighbor or speaking about the faith so there may be things that you don't understand but it's not encouraged and it's not, it's not to be done. You shouldn't come out and say, well, this is what Because the idea of unity is that if, let, let us say, it's, it's like um, the, what is it, cabinet, uh, you know, a cabinet authority. Once a vote's taken, all the cabinet have to adhere to it. You know, a government cabinet, if you, if you, even if you oppose it, you have to do it. And, and one of the Baha'i ideas is that if, say, say something happens and there's a decision made in unity, 
If you disagree with it, well, the decision has been made. You have to implement it and not criticize it. And the idea is, if, if you are correct and the decision is wrong, it will not work. But if you criticize it and backbite, it may not work because you've messed things up. But then the other people will say, it's only because he did that that it failed. So this idea of not criticizing is, is very big in the field. So I'm not going to do that. But th that's why I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, another question is, uh, how are the, all these like, the, the um, temples are really beautiful. How does that get paid for? Are there uh, membership dues or is it uh, kind of like within the Christian church where you pay tithing um, or is it just kind of a voluntary thing like you mentioned um, with the kind of the in getting rid of inequality? Yes, there are a number of funds. There's local Baha'i funds, there's national Baha'i funds, there's international funds. And there is a, a fund called, called Akukawa. Let me just, what's Akukawa? What does it mean again? The right of God. The right of God. Oh, yeah, which is probably the right of God, Akukawa, which is somewhat similar to tithing in Christian and other origins. So you have a number of areas that people contribute to. And so all this is paid for by Baha'is. And sometimes that's why you may see long gaps between things getting done because there wasn't enough cash. Okay. All right. Um, I think there are any verbal questions. I don't see any hands raised, but I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Um, okay, one last question. Are the Baha'i writings considered holy, and does the collection of Baha'i writings have a name like the Bible? Yeah. Yes, they are considered holy, and there are so many of them, it can't be. There's a number of different books and tablets. They tend to call them tablet of this or the tablet of that. And so Baha'u'llah may have written it, or the Bab, or Abdul Baha. And there isn't uh, an overall one uh, that, that covers everything. It's just so vast. And so there is, there's a number of different titles, but not a single book like the Quran, the Torah, or the Bible. And then I actually just saw this question. Um, what is the significance of the nine entrances at each of the temples? Yeah, but Baha'is believe that there are, and I can't tell, probably not know, but basically we, we'd spoken about the unity of religion and you had uh, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, uh, Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, and essentially there are nine religions which still survive. Baha'is believe there have been hundreds and hundreds of prophets, but, and that depends on what mankind was written for or humankind was written for. So they, that's why there's nine, because there's nine religions that are still surviving that Baha'is recognize. And there's a, there's a kind of religious significance to number nine. Uh, and uh, I'm not totally sure of that, but yeah, Baha'is, the nine pointed star is the symbol of Baha'i. Very cool. Well, thank you for being here today and thank I you for uh, educating us. One question somebody had asked, uh, I noticed it in the thing, and he was speaking about, he or she was speaking about Islam and obviously the prophet Muhammad said he was the seal of the prophets and he would be the last prophet. And this is one of the reasons Baha'is are heavily persecuted is because 
Muslims believe there can be no other. Obviously, Christians aren't so bad because they believe Christ's going to come again. So they, they don't think that. But the, idea, the reason is that there, was, there, there are different cycles. And the Baha'i teaching is that there was what they call the Adamic cycle, starting with Adam. There was the Adamic cycle, and Muhammad was the last prophet in the Adamic cycle. And this is a new cycle. Baha'u'llah has started a new cycle which will go on into the future. And that, that's why the Baha'is and the seal of the prophet thing. Good to know. Because <laughs> I know in the, the Christian faith, there's not supposed to be anything after the last book in the Bible. And that's why they use it to, to dismiss Islam. So. So it's always interesting to, to learn the whys behind stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for taking your time to, to educate us on, on the Baha'i faith. Um, I know, um, I think someone else said, you know, many of us probably haven't heard too much of it um, before today. So we really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Right. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, before we have our final song from Irma Linda, uh, we are going to post the link for donations and to sign up for our weekly newsletter. While we're no longer meeting in a physical space, we still have, uh, we are still paying the musicians and have some fixed expenses. Um, I know you've heard me mention before that we are sponsoring a, a scholarship for our student, a secular student alliance this year. And uh, we're excited because uh, SSA is making their um, final, uh, 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 making sure every, everything's in, in line. And so uh, we're excited to announce uh, the who we've chosen for that scholarship here very soon because they're almost finished with that. Um, and we um, have our new website. Please go check it out. We're all really excited about that. We're excited about bringing the other Oasis Network communities online so we all have kind of a similar template and layout across all the communities. So if you like what we're doing and you're able, please consider donating. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Special thank you to Jim and Irma Linda. Uh, tonight, be sure and join us for another Corona Conversation, 8 p.m. with uh, Drs. Richards and Will. Um, and I know uh, people are wondering, we sent out that survey about uh, doing a small, like, doing get-togethers across Houston. Uh, keep a lookout for when we send that out. We're um, we got the results. We're kind of looking at to how to best schedule it for everyone. Uh, so keep an eye out for future emails, Facebook posts, meet up, however you keep in contact with us. Uh, and uh, stay safe out there. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>